Hi, this is Fern G. Zedcar, website www.ferngzedcar.com. Welcome to my Facebook Live reading, Mind, Forms, Part 2, Forms. Well, if you've just tuned in, my name is Fern G. Zedcar. That was the first segment of this themed poetry reading, my final one. Um, now I'm going to start on my second theme, forms. And when I talk about forms, I'm not talking about geometric forms. I'm talking about different poetry forms. Uh, poetry is incredibly versatile and my writing is fairly eclectic. I like to use all kinds of different forms and types and styles. Now, as I say, because I'm doing this reading aloud, I had to choose the ones that were more or less to say user friendly, you know, in terms of people actually being able to uh, absorb all the content and appreciate all the content without seeing it on the printed page. Um, so I've, I've included some of the more traditional forms and I've also included some which are a little bit experimental on my part, less common. And as I say, there's such a wide range of choice. I'm just giving you a little sample here. So the types of poems that I'm going to share, one is called a wraparound poem. That's what I call it, but it's really just a version of a visual poem, um, a haiku, an echo poem, an ekphrastic poem, a modification of an acrostic poem, a guzzle, and a pantoum. And I'll explain each of them as I go along. So um, in my book, as a matter of fact, I have this, the one that I call the wraparound poem. And what I did was, it took me a little bit of uh, figuring out to, to use Photoshop, but what I did was I, I used Photoshop and I wrapped my poem around the shape of my cat's body. So I used a picture of my cat and then I used Photoshop to create a path uh, to have the poem follow this path. So um, I'll show it to you. I'm not sure how clearly you can see it, but that gives you the idea. So that poem is called Death Watch. And it's based on my experiences of when I was president of the SPCA and always at the shelter. An unblinking almond shaped jade eye stares over the flap of a cardboard box shoved to the back of a metal cage in an overcrowded shelter. A triangular jet black antenna of fur covered cartilage listens, sensing the impending demise of the last of her nine lives as she watches and waits to be euthanized. And I should just say that the part where I refer to the SPCA is about the wonderful care that they take of the cats and uh, of course, that was a starting point for this poem, but BCSPCA is a wonderful organization. Okay, um, now moving on to a haiku. Um, contemporary haiku doesn't necessarily follow the traditional pattern of uh, five syllables for the first line, seven syllables for the second, five for the last. But in this poem, I, I did use that pattern. And it's called Morning Mist Haiku, but I spelt the word morning in the title as M-O-U-R-N-I-N-G. So in the sense of mourning a loss, but then inside the poem, I spell morning as in time of day. So it just reinforces the idea of drowning in this poem. Morning Mist Haiku. Ghosts of morning mist hover above still waters overturned canoe. Okay, so my poem, Echo, 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 um, is, is kind of a strange poem to read to you because I could actually read you three poems and it's all the same poem. So on the printed page, it's displayed as two poems. So the second poem consists of only one word per line and it forms a right-hand column. And what the echo poem does is it repeats the sound at the end of a long line with that one word to the right of it on the same line. And as I said, the, the right hand column would make sense when it's read vertically as well. And even if you take the main chunk of poetry, that would read as a, uh, a poem in of itself. So essentially it's, it's three poems in one. Okay. 
echo, echo, echo. Echo verse pushes the poem to its bending, ending, point, nudging it towards unknown climbs, rhymes, farther than the most distant star are, until the poet feels he has been defeated, repeated, by a lack of creativity. Frustration has, as, frequently resulted in a state of woe, though, yet, when success manages to elicit a grin in Satisfaction is an intrinsic reward he can't deny. Reply. So the right-hand column, if you could see this on the printed page, says ending rhymes are repeated as though in reply. And that's a little bit of an in-joke for when I wrote the poem because that is the definition of an echo poem. Okay, so I mentioned ekphrastic poetry. Uh, ekphrastic poetry is poetry based on works of art. So I'm I was very fascinated by Salvador Dali's poem, a uh, painting, I should say, Persistence of Memory. And that's a painting where, if you're familiar with it, it's in a barren wasteland and you see images of melting uh, pocket watches strewn everywhere. Boredom. Minutes slog along in the mire of time, dragging their leaden feet like convicts on a chain gang. Plod, plod, plod. Trekking across the barren wasteland of Salvador Dali's painting, Persistence of Memory, melting watches dripping the beads of hours into eternity, engulfing moments and eons in its cavernous void. A hand manages to crawl to the next notch on the clock and marks its protest with a resentful tick. I guess that's the case if you use analog, not digital clocks. Never thought of that when I was writing that poem. Okay, now crosswalk is a modification of an acrostic poem. And in acrostic verse, what they do is the first letter of each line spells out a message. But instead, what I did was I used digits that sound like a word and those words are incorporated into my poem. And I also uh, upped my game by writing this poem like a crossword puzzle. So I have an, a section that says across, a section that says down, and it's all numbered. And I intentionally called this poem Crosswalk because I wanted it to fit in with the, the location where this poem takes place. And I also wanted to have that play on word cross as in crossword. Crosswalk. Across. One. Pair of frenzied eyes. Two. Agitated to cope. Three. Wishes. Four. Escape. Six. Feet under. Eight. Suicide attempts. Ten. Exhausted orderlies. Fifteen. Nurses institution wide. 20 milligrams of Thorazine ready, 24, seven. Down, two, much bar hopping, three, sheets to the wind, four, cocktail lounges later, seven months ago at a crosswalk, nine, emergency vehicles, 10 cops collecting body parts, 11, year old flattened, 13 year old sister decapitated, 16 traumatized witnesses, 24 ounces of rot gut to blame. Okay, a guzzle, G-H-A-Z-A-L, is an Arabic verse form and it has, it, it deals with love and loss that's sort of typical for a guzzle, and it has very specific requirements in terms of form. So both lines of the first couplet have to rhyme, and then every other couplet has its second line, line rhyming with the rhyme from the first couplet using the same ending word. So this is guzzle for M. 
You are my blanket of twinkling stars, a liberating obsession. The air I breathed, the water I drank, an intoxicating obsession. You embraced my essence in ways only we could comprehend. Your love was transcendent, my illuminating obsession. Then, when death came to snatch you with its bony fingers, my distress devolved into a devastating obsession. In desperation, I clung to you as you were slipping away. Thoughts of losing you became an excruciating obsession. Now the death's cruel grasp has wrenched us apart. The torment of my longing for you is a debilitating obsession. Okay, I'm going to end on a less depressing poem here. Um, it's a pantoum. I've actually written a few different pantoums. They're very interesting, a little bit tricky to write. Uh, it's a Malay verse form, and the second and fourth lines of each verse have to be repeated as the first and third lines of each subsequent verse, and then the pattern repeats. So it's, it's a bit of a trick to, to make it sound natural. So I chose this first form because it's extremely rhythmic and it lends itself to the mimicking of the chugging of a train. So this poem is called Train Whistle. Snorting horse's breath steams an early morning chill, bleary-eyed awakening to the whistle of a train, thrusting through farmland pregnant with fields of grain, romancing purple prairie thistle with serenade so shrill, Bleary-eyed awakening to the whistle of a train, chugging along rusty tracks with sturdy iron will, romancing purple prairie thistle with serenade so shrill, rhythmically chanting a lugubrious refrain. Chugging along rusty tracks with sturdy iron will, oblivious to the monotony of flat prairie terrain, rhythmically chanting a lugubrious refrain, swathed in semi-darkness while all is hushed and still. Oblivious to the monotony of flat prairie terrain, beckoning the horizon with its plaintive chill, swathed in semi-darkness while all is hushed and still, in muted decrescendo, it heads across the plain. Well, I hope you enjoyed the poems that I read to you today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, for more information, I would invite you to visit my website at www.ferngzcar.com. There's a Wikipedia article about me under Fern G. Z. Carr, and I do invite you to visit my YouTube channel. Subscription is free, and I have, uh, besides performances and um, uh, my poetry that I translated into other languages, I also have, I'm going to be having a new section coming up in the near future about interviews. And I also have some free lesson plans for teachers and parents homeschooling their children and poetry study guides and resources for poets as well. They're all free. Subscription is free. You just have to push the subscribe button and, and that's it. And my book Shards of Crystal is available on Amazon. Acknowledgements. All poems contained herein copyright Fern G. Z. Carr. Part 2 is an excerpt from the original full video, which was kindly sponsored by the League of Canadian Poets and the Canada Council for the Arts. Thanks very much for watching my video. If you enjoyed it, feel free to like and please be sure to subscribe. For more poetry, my book Shards of Crystal is available on Amazon. Thanks again, and stay tuned for a new video every Wednesday.